Okay, then you will realize that in high school you will learn that also those, uh, ecos the, the, you will learn about the invisible world which is made of, um, of uh, bacteria and viruses because some of them infect, you know, uh, make disease to us. But there is a fifth category of life which is extremely important and that people have, very, have neglected. And even my, you know, my, biologist, my biologist colleagues don't know much about it. So what is this fifth category of life? Amazingly enough, you have all seen it. It's very obvious, in fact. And here it is. This is the fifth category of life. So what is in common between you know, the, white, the white cliff of Dover, the Cathedral Notre Dame de Paris, and the, the Egyptian pyramids? In fact, all of these, all of these big buildings are made of little tiny skeleton of protists. So this is a coccolithophore, and those are foraminifers building those things, almost pure protists. So protists are the first are unicellular um, organisms, which are the first who enclosed you know, the, the genetic material inside a nucleus. So you have the nuclear membrane, the cellular membrane, and a very intense traffic of vesicles and membranes in between, between the nucleus and the cell. And in fact, if you look at the history of the Earth system as a whole, you have four billion years. It is quite amazing to realize that for two-thirds of it, you had exclusively viruses and bacteria on Earth. The first protist appeared a billion years ago, about, and then they radiated into a huge diversity of, life, of at least eight mega divisions of life. One of them gave rise to the animals later, and another one of them gave rise to the plants much later, 400 million years ago. <clears throat> so protists are, are quite fantastic because well, for one, one, one important thing is that so they are making these you know, active membranes and with these membranes they can grab the world, the exterior world and they can build lots of uh, very beautiful skeletons made of matter from the outside world. Like for instance, they build these skeletons in polysaccharides which are sort of plastics for these dinoflagellates. They can build also skeleton in glass. This is glass. So each of these guys are just one cell. Imagine these cells are building glasses, you know, at the temperature of the seawater, at the seawater temperature. To make, you know, rough object of glass, we need to heat sands at at least 1,000 degrees. So they are really, really talented uh, nanotechnology, in nanotechnologies. Maybe the most amazing are those coccolithophores, which are building a um, little object of calcite inside the cell and then extruding this object to make this beautiful structure. I will show you a little movie of a colleague of mine, Alison Taylor, from the University of North Carolina, who basically decalcified a coccolithophore, this cell. And here you can see the cell building this little, fantastic little object, which are just one micron. So inside the cell, you can see this big, big stone comparative to the cell building inside and then extruding out, outside the cell and assembling it into this beautiful structure. This cell is relatively simple compared to the one I will show you in the next slide. In the next slide, you will have spaces which build different kinds of structure and which assemble them in even more complex and beautiful uh, assemblages. So I let you just enjoy this last you know, piece of uh, nanotechnology. And look at those cells. So this is just one cell building this, all these structures and assembling them into, this is calcite. And just the last one, the cell is inside, and imagine it's building these big rocks, you know, comparative to the size of the cell, inside the cell, and assembling them. This is just unbelievable, right? So protists are not only very beautiful, but they're also extremely powerful. And in fact, this is on the coast of Norway, and here below the clouds, you see the, all this milky water in the ocean. And this is pure protist. This is a bloom of this coccolithophores. And in fact, coccolithophores are blooming in the northern and southern hemisphere in spring. They can also sometimes, for instance, this is a red, the Black Sea, which is turning totally white, just of this species, Emiliania huxleyi. This particular species makes more calcites than any other species on Earth, any other, even the corals. Or so it's quite amazing, I think, to see that we had to take distance from our home, Earth, to realize the, you know, the great importance of this forgotten piece of life, which are protists. In fact, protists are very close to us. And look at this little movie. You should be, you know, it should, uh, it should touch you, in fact, this movie. It should, uh, 
you should feel some emotion when, this, when you see this because this is actually you, you guys. You all have, you know, thousands, thousands of these so-called neutrophiles in your blood vessels. Here you have the blood cells, the erythrocytes. And here, this is a human cell, you know, hunting for bacteria. So you have thousands of these cells, you know, in your blood, cleaning your, your blood of, of bacteria. I just put another little movie of an amoeba, just to see, you know, the similarity between a human cell and a, an amoeba. <clears throat> in fact, it is quite remarkable to know that the blood, the, blood uh, the, compos the chemical composition of the blood is very similar to the ocean in terms of salt. So really, you know, a, a human body is 7,000 different type of cells. You have two of them here in a piece of ocean. We are really a walking piece of ocean, we can say, I think. So here is another um, uh, human protist, and you may, you may have uh, realized, so this is spermatozoid, and also spermatozoid, you know, tell us that we all were, at some point in our life, you know, a free-living protist out there. So there is one place on Earth where protists are almost as abundant as the spermatozoids, and this is here. This is plankton. And plankton, so this is an amazing, actually, footage um, uh, provided by David Hannan in, Austra in, uh, in Australia. And this is real, you know, microorganism from the plankton. I have never seen this, li this little organism that, like that from the ocean, directly into the ocean. It has been taken during nighttime in Papua New Guinea, and you see this planktonic world, which is totally crazy. We are in a movie of Charlie Chaplin almost, right? Everything is v moving very, very fast. It's, very, it's colorful. And there are, of course, so, you know, if you compare it to the forest I showed you previously, there is no plants. There is no this big, you know, tree static. And in fact, the protists are making this reaction of, you know, grabbing uh, through, the, through the light. They are making the carbon and producing the oxygen. So they are replacing the role of plants, but much before plants. <coughs> So quite amazing, right? It's like an explosion of, uh, of life. And this ecosystem is, in fact, by far, by far the largest on Earth. 98% of the volume of the biosphere is plankton. 98%. We have uh, satellites have been taking pictures of, of this plankton for the last 10 years. Basically, the satellite took pictures of the color of the oceans. And all this green matter you see here on the Earth is a photosynthetic protist and cyanobacteria, which are, you know, grabbing, creating life in the ocean. And then you have all sorts of other plankton, viruses, bacteria, zooplankton. But what is very important is that with this satellite picture, we could calculate that plankton is producing half the carbon on Earth, and is producing half the oxygen we breathe. More important than that, this matter is also sinking. Part of this matter, you know, when, it, when it's dying, it's sinking to the deep ocean and then to the bottom, to the, to the floor. A little piece of it is going to the floor of the ocean. And this is very important because this puts, you know, this build up a hundred meter thick or kilometer thick layers of dead plankton at the bottom of the ocean. And this mechanism called the, the ocean pump is the one that created the oxidized atmosphere we are breathing today. And is the one also which is very important to maintain uh, the climate we are living in today. So, for, so I've been, uh, I, I'm obsessed with, you know, plankton and protist. And <laughs> so I have been dreaming for a long time to, uh, to, to put together a, a big expedition to explore, to really know what is in this green matter. And so I met, I was very lucky to meet uh, five years ago, very interesting people, a few other, you know, uh, protist, plankton, uh, um, addict, uh, scientist, uh, Eric Carsanti, uh, Gabi Gorski, and Chris Bowler. And also, very importantly, uh, we met Etienne Bourgois and Romain Troublé, who is in this audience today. And because Etienne and Romain are the owner of a beautiful boat, which is called Tara. Uh, it's, a, it's a sailing boat that belonged to, uh, to, to Peter Blake pre previously. And we all decided together to put uh, the, the, the largest ever, you know, a plankton fishing party that we ever have done. So we equipped Tara. Here is Tara. This is his boat, it's a 36 meter sailing boat. And we equip, we equip Tara with different gears to collect plankton from the smallest organisms to the largest, of course, including protists, because I was part of the, of the game. <coughs> um, so I will show you how, how it looked a bit. So this is a deck of Tara, so we put uh, different gears, plankton nets, pumping system, 
Uh, we had a lot of fancy instruments to measure the physics and the chemistry of the environment. And uh, we had a little, you know, laboratory here. This is now inside this laboratory. So we were, uh, we, we sampled plankton from the smallest organisms, the viruses, to the animals, to the largest, 11 size fractions, very, very systematically. And we, we were uh, preserving this plankton for later, you know, high throughput genetic and morphological analysis. So we have done this incredible cruise of two years and a half across the ocean. We just finished it uh, two months ago. We came back to Brittany, where I live, here. And in this, uh, along this track, each of these little red dots here is a place where we stopped for two, three days and where we collected plankton from three depths, 11 size fraction, with lots of, you know, of environmental data. So we come back with a huge, huge database of, you know, of material, the largest ever on plankton. Now I will show you just uh, one of the first results we got. So we are using basically the material we, we got is to, is to analyze using very high throughput sequencing of DNA and uh, imaging methods that can take automatic imaging. So this is uh, the first sequencing we did uh, in 36 stations, which are quite widespread around the world. And we have sequenced here a uh, half a billion uh, little piece of ribosomes. Ribosomes are the molecules which translate the DNA into proteins. And they are very good markers of the biodiversity, basically. If you have a different ribosome, you have a different taxa, taxon. <coughs> so we sequence these ribosomes in these different stations. And which is quite remarkable is that we, we observe that, so this is a number of sequence we got, and this is a number of different ribosomal species. And so you can see that we are reaching with half a billion ribosome, the saturation of the di we are saturating the diversity of eukaryotes in the, in the ocean, protists plus animals. Basically, we are saturating at about 1.5 million you know, uh, ribosomal species of these organisms, which correspond more or less to species or genus level. So this seems huge for people who are studying you know, you know, a plankton um, with uh, studying the morphology of the organisms. For me, I was expecting much more. I thought the world was much more complex than that. Knowing the complexity of protists, I thought it could be you know, billions of species. So I'm very happy with these results because we see the boundary, we see the limit of the system, and we see that we are going to understand that we are really going to be able to count these organisms using their, their DNA sequence and to, to understand their ecology. So it's very promising. Now, in parallel to, in parallel to this genetic study, what we do is that we use a uh, high throughput microscope to picture. So here you can see basically half a liter of water stained with different dyes. So we can stain these cells with different dyes. And then you can, and the microscope take picture automatically of all the objects. It can classify the objects. There are wonderful softwares to make uh, cell recognition and make families. So here you have a zoom of this little part, for instance. And then you can, you can also tell the microscope to come back to a cell and really enter into the cell and do different slices of the cell and see really what is inside those cells, those protists. So here you see the, really the, you know, the, the inside the, the, the cells, and you can even reconstruct 3D movies of these protists, uh, which we have never seen, like, you know, this is an acantharian, this is a dinoflagellate, and this is a datum with all the structure, the nucleus, the different organelles, etc. So this is very important because besides the genetic, you know, description of the world, we also give a body to the sequences, which is very important because yeah, we need to understand the biodiversity of the planets, but also what are these organisms made of and what are they are used what for in the, in the ecosystem. <coughs> okay, so I actually I will finish my, my talk with, uh, with this last uh, slide, which, <coughs> which tells you about you know, the dream we all had when we started this Taraocean expedition. And actually, the, really the dream is that, you know, the, the ultimate cell, the ultimate protist, you know, the, the really the one for all, like the title of this session, is really the Earth system. I think the Earth system looks amazingly like a cell. You know, it it's really looks like a cell. Here you can see a movie by NASA of, uh, which, which is, um, you know, a modeling of the uh, surface current of the Earth. So it's really the Earth's physiology, if you want. So we can model the, the Earth's physiology pretty well today. You can also, you know, if you work with uh, paleo, uh, paleontologists and paleoecologists, -ecolo we have wonderful data on the Earth's uh, Earth ontogeny. You know, this is uh, not a 
which is depicting, depicted here in, this, um, in the drift of the continent, right? The time scale, of course, is in million years, but you can see the, you know, the drift of the continent, and this is not, you know, a cyclic phenomenon. This is really a directional phenomenon. So this is Earth ontogeny. It reminds me a bit, you know, this little coccolithophore building these plates. And so now, today, what is very interesting is that biology is producing tons, tons, tons of, you know, sequencing data and imaging data. So biology is really turning into a no new science, which is a systems-based science. We are getting out of the models, the studying models. We have to study systems. And this is also really what we wanted to do in Taha, is to show that we are able to build up, you know, a systemic, ecosystemic database at the, at the planetary scale. Just to show you where we are going to a bit, I show you this movie here, this last movie. And this is a model done by Mick Follows at MIT, which is part of our team, of Tao Ocean team. And Mick basically is, um, is using, you know, the, the Earth's physiology, and he's putting different cells in the systems and letting them grow, letting them evolve, eat each other, etc., and increasing the, mod the complexity of this stochastic modeling. And then you can see how things are auto-organized in the physiology of the Earth. And basically, you can mimic, you know, where the organisms are distributed in, in the Earth. And it's very, it, it's very interesting. So I think, you know, in, a, in the next maybe 30 years, we are really going to have some really good modeling of, of the planet Earth, which is like a cell. And it is very important because we'll be able to, to really, know, you know, know this system and, and, uh, and know how, how we can, how humanity can, can live in, a, in symbiosis with all these organisms. Because we depend on all organisms, you know, there is not a single organism which can live without the others. And, it's, um, and so this is uh, one of the aim of this Taoshan expedition. Thank you. <coughs>